Ms. Vice President, Iran Chamber of Commerce, Industries, Mines and Agriculture, and Vice President of CASI. Dr. Pedram Soltani. Mr. Ashish Gopal, Managing Director, Merico Bangladesh Limited. Now I would like to turn over the floor to Mr. Pradeep Kumar Sreshta, Kasi Vice President, former President of FNCCI. A very late good afternoon. I think uh, after a long uh, full day session, I know to keep you all holding here in this session will be a very, very difficult task for all of us. Uh, the whole day, uh, the deliberation has been so interesting. Uh, now, I will leave it to the panelists to make it more interesting than what they have done in, in the previous session, you know, so that you all go back with a very good uh, uh, some, some enlightened uh, deliberation from all the panelists. Uh, the session uh, that I'm told to be chairing uh, uh, is, of course, uh, the pursuit of equitable and sustainable growth. Uh, but before I go to introduce the panelists, uh, I must thank ABCCI, the organizing team, president, and the whole uh, members uh, for having all of us here. Uh, the, the way this uh, deliberation has been done, from the day one, from welcome dinner to the inauguration this morning, and the very two previous uh, session uh, has been very, very enlightening. And I'm sure every members who have attended will go back with the very fond memories and uh, something new to carry home uh, and tell their friends and family that the program of CASI, 33rd CASI conference in Bangladesh was worth and tell them also what they missed also in Bangladesh, you know. Uh, I am Pradeep Sreshta. I am the uh, past president of the Federation and now the vice president of the CASI. So I think I also need to be introduced to you, you know. I am from Nepal, a landlocked country. And I say we have been sandwiched between India and China, you know. But I say we are the cream of the sandwich. We are the cheese of the sandwich, you know. So you have to also know what country I come from, what advantages we have in this, in our country. This morning I was trying to say, but the time given was so limited that I could not share what I wanted to share, you know. Anyway, but uh, the potential of hydropower, tourism, and the, you know, the, the agriculture sector is so high that those who are not visited Nepal, 2020 is our visit Nepal year, so please do come to Nepal. We like to show you and make you see what Nepal can offer. Uh, this session is a very, very interesting session, you know. And we have a very three, uh, five prominent uh, learned speakers. Uh, and some are doctors, some are very, very experienced. And uh, I don't need to, uh, you know, curtail them with the timings because we are already much ahead of what we should have started. We should have started by five o'clock. Now it is already 5.30, uh, 5.35. So I was supposed to be finishing this session by 6, uh, actually, but I don't know whether it is possible or not. Uh, not I mean 6.30. So I will try to limit my, uh, I request the speakers to limit their uh, in the presentation, make it short and sweet so that we have a little bit of time for the questions, you know. And at least from the audience, should there be any question, uh, I think we can also share on that. Uh, so I would like to introduce, to save time, I'm going to introduce all the speakers myself, you know, a very, very short speaker. And should they add, need to add more, probably they, they can do that also. The first speaker, uh, Mr. Abul Kalam Azad, uh, who is also a very pr uh, prominent uh, personality in Bangladesh. And he also is the principal coordinator for SDG, you know, uh, the Sustainable Development Goal Affairs to the Honorable uh, Prime Minister. Uh, office of Bangladesh. Uh, so his presentation will certainly uh, let us know uh, the, the subject that he's going to touch on. Uh, the next, of course, uh, is uh, Dr. Pai 
Fu Li. Uh, he is from Taiwan, and he is the uh, Secretary General of International Cooperation Development Fund of Taiwan. Uh, the details are already there in, with you, in the so I don't want to uh, linger with the introduction. Uh, the third speaker on the very right uh, is uh, Rogner uh, Goodmorton. Uh, he is a uh, resident representative in Bangladesh for the International Monetary Fund. So I'm going to, I'm sure he is, he'll be one where uh, he, their uh, institution could uh, help uh, the growth development and pros bring prosperity in, in, in this region, you know. And uh, to my immediate right, uh, he is uh, Dr. Pedran Soltani from Iran, who also happens to be the Vice President of CASI and the first Vice President of Iran Chamber. We'll be looking in forward to hear from him, his Iranian experience, and touching the subject that we are going to discuss on. And to my very far uh, left, uh, Mr. Asis Kopal, who is Managing Director of Medico Bangladesh Limited, which is, a, I think, FND company, very, coming up very, very fast. And he also export to a lot of countries uh, with his base also in India. So not taking much of the time. Uh, so I will first of all request uh, Mr. Abdul Kalam Azad uh, to uh, do his uh, presentation. And I will limit him for being a very senior man. Uh, 10 minutes is enough, sir? So. Okay, thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> Please, thank you sir. very much. So you are uh, with uh, Nepal. So Honorable Prime Minister sent a uh, huge quantity of rice when uh, earthquake was there. As a scout, I sent my scout team uh, for the rescue operation in Nepal. You are sandwich, but we want to support you uh, in between uh, China and India. Uh, so always our Prime Minister extends her cooperation for the landlocked country like Nepal and Bhutan. So thank you for your nice introduction. The topic is very interesting. Uh, the equitable and sustainable growth. This is the main uh, theme of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDG. And uh, you all know, SDG says no one left behind. So the no one left behind and the uh, uh, topic of today's discussion is the same. I will limit my discussion on the issues, uh, especially in education, health, agriculture, industry, social safety net, and if any other uh, time permits. If we look into the growth of Bangladesh in last 10 years, our GDP, it's multiplied 3.5 times. And uh, our annual development uh, program, ADP, is seven times. So this, is, this cannot be imagined in any of the country. So the political leadership is the basis for that. And uh, that made the uh, social structure. If I look into the education, you see uh, on the first day of the year, 1st of January, last year, uh, see about 360 million copy of books were distributed free. 360 million from class 1 to class 12. So all these students get new books every year. So I used to tell to the students nowadays that um, I feel very angry with them because during my childhood, I believe the Bangladeshi, they will uh, bear me out that we could get at least at best one, two or three books new. All we used to collect old books and read that for that year. But now all these students, they get new books. We took one book, kept uh, uh, beside uh, my pillow in the night, in the night when sleep was broken, we took the smell of the new books. But now these, all these boys and girls, they are getting new books. Only not for the general student. If they are uh, uh, impaired student, uh, the uh, blind students, they used to get last year 8,000 Braille uh, books. Uh, we 
provided them talking books so that he can press button and a specific topic he will hear he or she will hear for the students uh, in primary school all these students they get a special stipend and especially the girls and this small amount of money is sent to their mother through their mobile phone uh, not only the primary school in high school the girls they have their free education so this made a miracle if you go to schools primary school high school and even university the presence of the girls is much more obviously in primary school high school is about 52 53 percent uh, girls in university also about 30 percent if you look into the medical education recruitment of doctors more than 50 percent are female so this gave this gave us encouragement how to bring the women forward um, food supplement in primary school and high school also food supplement midday meal uh, all these are uh, uh, arranged from the government and uh, some of them from the locality from the mothers from the guardians in some places where we could not provide uh, uh, the midday meal uh, local administration they distributed tiffin box this tiffin box encourages the mother to put the tiffin every day in that box so that when his or her kid come to school they carry some tiffin from their home in this way we are trying to um, encourage all these students so that the duration in school is much more longer the students they don't absent in the schools and we have successive uh, uh, examination system after class 5 after class 10 after class 8 after class 10 and and so on if we look into the climate vulnerables so many steps we have taken to cope up with the situation and bangladesh is the single country those who have their own climate change trust fund which we uh, uh, did in 2009 and about 500 million dollar we spent from our own exchequer in the garment sector if you see some of the uh, uh, partners from uh, here from the garment sector you will find out of 10 lead um, uh, garments factory in the globe seven are from bangladesh wherever we used to discuss about the climate vulnerability whenever we discuss about the standard of manufacturing uh, sometimes bangladesh uh, by some of the country being tried to make malign but you see out of 10 lead factories seven are from bangladesh in public health government uh, used to have a target to spend five percent of its budget in education 15 percent and also in social protection 15 percent of its gdp we want to spend for which will bring the backward people on the same line with others if you look into the social safety net currently about 29 percent of our population are under social safety net with a target to bring 40 percent by 2030 under social safety net program so what are these social safety nets the widows the old people freedom fighters uh, uh, the uh, vulnerable poor people the people those who are being displaced by the river erosion so 40 percent we have a target so that uh, they can be brought under the social safety net program 100 economic zone not in one place uh, distributed all over the country so that we can have the job opportunity in next 10 years we want to have 15 million job opportunity uh, if it is distributed all over the country so uh, agro products will be much more encouraged so that in this economic zone we can add value for export uh, we have a land back of 50,000 acres we are trying to have another 50,000 acre uh, this will be brought under the 
per view of the Bangladesh Economic Zones Authority very soon. Uh, investment climate. We are trying to have the one-stop service, OSS. A law has been passed. Or in the meantime, our economic zone and our investment development authority, they established their one-stop service center. And by that, we, are sta we have started providing the uh, one-stop service from those centers. For the new uh, investors, entrepreneurs, startup, for the first time uh, in our country, 100 crore taka. Uh, this is specially allocated for the um, entrepreneurs uh, from 1 crore to 5 crore taka. But this fund as uh, government allocated for the first time, this is not limited to 100 crore taka. This will be much more as per the necessity of the country. If you consider our SDG, 928 billion extra is required. We believe from the skill development and from the uh, blue economy, from the vast ocean which we got through a legal battle from Myanmar and India, I believe these two idioms will encourage us will, uh, for these extra 928 billion. You all know Bangladesh is graduating from LDC. In the meantime, last year, it is recommended first time for LDC graduation. Year after next year, we will have the second recommendation. And we believe by 2024, we will be graduated from LDC. This will put us a huge challenge, but always we used to say that if one door is closed, we want to open 100 doors so that the opportunity will not be lessened, but this will be increased in uh, multiple uh, fold. We used to work with South-South cooperation. From Bangladesh, we used to provide so many cooperation for different South countries. In terms of SDG, we have one SDG tracker. Uh, this enables any policy decision maker with a finger of his tips, he or she can understand where Bangladesh is uh, in terms of implementation of SDG. This software we are uh, uh, sharing with different countries. If anyone, you can see in our website, and we used to share this with different country. So South-South Cooperation, Triangular Cooperation, we work and we extend our support to all of you. So we believe with remittance, especially we are working for the remittance sender, the family, those who get the remittance, how to utilize this money uh, for their uh, better livelihood. I believe with all this, uh, the target of our GDP growth is a double digit in the next decade. Day before yesterday, Honorable Prime Minister discussed about the strategic plan 2021-2041. So a 20-year strategic plan, uh, Bangladesh uh, is going to finalize in a couple of months. And this is another information for the global participants that Bangladesh, this is the single country, those who have a, a long-term visionary plan, 2100 Delta plan, um, where Bangladesh needs to go. So our successive plan steer is by 2021, we want to be a... Uh, middle, uh, higher middle income country, 2030 we want to implement the SDG, 2041 we want to be one of the developed country, 2071, this is 100 years of Bangladesh and 2100 is the Delta plan. I believe Bangladesh will be uh, a leading country in the uh, implementation of SDG and also the equitable and sustainable growth. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Sir. <coughs> I just gave him two, three minutes extra, you know, I have to respect uh, his position also. But for others, I'm sure they are going to uh, agree on me and respecting the time. Now, of course, I have uh, uh, Lee Pai, he is also a doctor. He has a long experience of uh, maybe, maybe more than two, two decades. And uh, please uh, go ahead with your presentation, sir.
Thank you, uh, Chairman. So, you know, the Taiwan ICDF, their full name is the International Cooperation and Development Fund. It's the uh, functional carrier like the uh, Japan, uh, JICA, or the uh, Korea, the uh, Koi card. So it's a very uh, great honor for me to present the uh, topic together for an equitable and uh, sustainable future uh, Taiwan ICDF effort in the uh, Asia and Pacific. There are five uh, major parts, global sustainable development reality, second role of uh, official development assistance. The uh, number three, the uh, realization of the equitable and sustainable future, uh, including the regional strategies and practical cases. Also the number four, pattern for sustainable uh, feature uh, enhancing the uh, variety of uh, the partnership also called for the uh, PPP. That's final one, the conclusion. Sorry. No accent. No? Sorry. I'm picked. Yeah. You have the other one to I think the battery Centrally, must be weak. Uh, PPT, no? So laptop support Please. Okay, yeah. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay. So the uh, reality here, according to the UN uh, statistic, you know, in year 2013, for the uh, poverty reduction, a uh, little bit uh, decline uh, compared to the uh, before. In terms of the malnutrition, A21 uh, in year 2017 compared to the 2015 uh, still declines. And uh, seven million uh, deaths because of the air pollution. Also the, you, the women's uh, the three times more hours a day is because of the gender-based socioeconomic uh, disadvantage. And the 11.2 you know, the uh, solid waste. So all of that, the, uh, you know, the statistic is completely uh, harmful to the global uh, development. Does. Based on that, the statistics, some is the positive uh, progress, for instance, the, the uh, equity, uh, also the quality education, and the uh, clean energy does. But some is could be uh, less uh, than that. Uh, for instance, the health, uh, others also have to make the progress. In terms of the ODA from ICDF, we provide to help in uh, the uh, global society through, you know, the strategic alliance. Here is history. Since 1959, there were 60 years. The evolu organization uh, evolution in 1996 is a formally established of this organization. So we provide the technology, also the financial services, uh, human capital to join the Taiwan competitive advantage, responding to the partner needs, also integrate public-private uh, sector resources, and the uh, strengthen the competitive uh, the partnership. One. There are four, uh, five, sorry, five major core sectors include the agriculture, uh, the full security of the rural development, uh, environment, climate change, uh, CO2 concentration, marine uh, sustainability, public health and medicine for the health uh, promotion and education, the capacity building, the ICT for the uh, good governance. Mass. Here is a map, you know, according to the SDG, 
you know the general uh, strategy is come uh, cover the uh, four uh, sorry five major goal uh, goal two three four eight and seventeen. If uh, in the Asian country is a uh, well additional eight uh, twelve thirteen and the uh, fifteen. Uh, in Asia and Pacific, in terms of development uh, issue, uh, for instance, food insecurity, malnutrition, uh, economic recession, uh, also the uh, declines of use of renewable energy, disparity of quality of education across the region, insufficient action for environmental uh, protection. So here this uh, regional in the uh, Asia Pacific, we will to make some program implementation, sustainable agriculture, food security, nutrition uh, part, also the uh, economic goals, uh, the SME uh, incubation, and the household income uh, increase, and the human capital development, uh, you know, the including that the education, uh, formal education, the higher education system, uh, non-formal and uh, informal. Uh, education later I will to give more. In the uh, some cases I like to uh, take here uh, for your reference. In the nutrition part, the Palo Island, we have the uh, horticulture uh, programs. These are the uh, for vegetable production, the on the first stage, but the after that to for the nutrition from the seeding, also the compost, after that the nutrition uh, provide for the local people. Same in the Marshall Island, uh, use this uh, same idea for the food security and uh, sustainable, the livelihood food. Also in the uh, PNG, uh, Papua New Guinea also have the same, uh, you know, programs. In agribusiness in Indonesia, we have uh, the uh, small and uh, mini and also the agribusiness in Bandung. Uh, here is will be uh, set up the greenhouse. Also the packaging, uh, shipping, houses, also the, uh, to get the assistance for the farmer, a group, a grouper, uh, the cooperative. Also the, uh, you know, the training center, uh, for local people, uh, the digital appliance of the app for the mobile phone. Here there's an energy, energy part, equitable access to the energy. The loan programs in Marshall Island have the uh, two uh, dimensions. One, energy efficiency uh, sub-loan is a, will be uh, focused on the uh, energy saving appliance. Second one, to provide the solar energy, uh, solar panel uh, for renewable energy sub-loans is also the, uh, you know, this uh, very uh, useful. Uh, same like the uh, TA, uh, technical assistance in Myanmar, uh, we use uh, this one to help the local village. Uh, you know, there's a village in the after, uh, you know, sunset is become dark because of this uh, PV uh, panel system to help local people distribute LED uh, light bulbs, uh, not only for the household, but also for the public schools, uh, temple, and so on. Same, these are the pilot projects expand to the second stage is coming from the uh, Taiwanese uh, local enterprises so we engage this one. In terms of the uh, education part, we give the uh, professional workshop uh, every year. Taiwan will conduct 16 or 18 uh, professional workshop to help Pacific and the Asian, particularly Southeast Asian country and the South Asian country, the total 1,800. Vocational training for you know practical uh, skill for local people. Also the higher education to provide the uh, PhD, master and undergraduate for the uh, quality uh, manpower cultivation. Also the healthcare uh, personnel training is an only job uh, training system. Uh, here that's the according to the OECD every year have spent 3.3 to 4.5 trillions. Uh, the years about the money, but the ODA is only take about 3.6%. So the uh, ODA very important, but not e efficiency. So how to the, uh, the variety of the partnership 
also the PPP uh, collaboration. In my data system with the US, uh, Japan, also Australia, and uh, the uh, multilateral organization and the international organization and the international INGO. Also the uh, PPP one uh, from this uh, statistic, for instance, uh, 12 trillion uh, for the private sector, 1 point billion for the global smart agriculture or precision uh, agriculture. The energy part also the uh, two trillions. The other one also the uh, other uh, sector will provide this one. So the business matching uh, forums from ICD we also to introduce the uh, business into the uh, cooperating country for the business uh, opportunity. So finally, the conclusion I like to, you know, uh, to introduce for you that the equitable and sustainable uh, growth are still the uh, key point of uh, the SDG uh, implementation. In the regional grouping in Asia Pacific region, and the world, uh, you know, still very expanding that the, expert, the impact of this SDG implementation. But the most important, you know, the uh, private sector, particularly for foreign direct investment, uh, is the one of important part for the private sector development. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Dr. Lee. Uh, now going to the third uh, panelist, our speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ragnar uh, Rudmotsen, uh, he is from IMF. He is resident representative in Bangladesh. Okay. Good evening. Maybe we can put up my, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, first of all, to this gathering and to contribute to a session which covers several important challenges from the need for inclusive growth and job creation to the objective of meeting the SDGs and also the urgency of addressing climate change. As I cannot cover each of these topics in uh, depth, what I will try to do in my allotted time is just to give you, is to highlight some of the key messages coming from a, re a recent research and analysis done by the IMF. So first of all, let me briefly summarize some of the main economic developments that we see on the horizon for the region. Okay, so what we observe, first of all, is that while Asia Pacific is still the world's fastest growing major region, contributing more than two thirds to global growth, Near-term prospects have deteriorated noticeably over the last six months. Growth in Asia is now expected to moderate to 5% in 2019 and 5.1% in 2020. And you know, what's interesting is that this would con constitute the slowest expansion of the region since the global financial crisis in 2008. As you probably know, the headwinds stem from prolonged global policy uncertainty, distortionary trade measures, and growth deceleration in the economies of important trading partners in the region. A major contributor to this uncertainty has been the trade tensions between the US and China and the tariff escalation that has taken place since 2018. And you can see this illustrated on the right-hand side of the chart. So really the, the deterioration in the trade relations between the US and China have had a major impact, not only on the trade relations between those two major powers, but for the global economy as a whole. And Asia has notably suffered from a marked deceleration in merchandise trade and investment. And this has been weighing on economic activity, particularly in the manufacturing sector. So exports in Asian emerging markets have been shrinking since late 2018, and this has been largely dragged down by weak intra-regional trade, especially with China. In China, GDP growth slowed to 6.2% last year, uh, no, it's 6.2% uh, year over year in the second quarter of this year, and our high-frequency indicators all point 
to a continued deceleration in economic activity. So the trend that we saw uh, at the end of the first half of this year is being continued in July and August. And you know, this, this kind of slowdown and, and these tensions are reflected in uh, the business sentiment that we see both in the US and in China. So what we also see, what's very important, is the extent to which these trade tensions have an impact on the financial markets. What we see is that following a tightening in uh, conditions through the first quarter of 2019, financial conditions for Asian emerging market economies have eased since April 2019, and capital flows to the region have been robust. So this is a, let's say, a positive trend for the region in a difficult global environment. However, as you can see in the right side chart, capital flows um, to the region reversed once more over the last uh, two months following the announcement of some follow-up trade escalation, tariff escalation measures. So overall, while financial conditions appear set to remain accommodative over the coming year, we must be careful that, that an ab abrupt change in financing conditions uh, and, an, and a change in the global appetite for risk could lead to a tightening of financial conditions and a reversal of capital flows and that could lead to a further uh, slowdown in growth for the region. So what does this mean looking forward? What this means is that in this uncertain global environment uh, we need to focus on policies that are aimed at buffering this slowdown where necessary, strengthening resilience to growing downside risks, and also raising inclusive medium-term growth. On the fiscal side, fiscal policy should support domestic demand in countries where this is needed and where there is fiscal space. Monetary policy should generally remain accommodative and calibrated to local circumstances, and financial sector policies should be strengthened as needed to ensure that the accommodative monetary policy that we are witnessing does not lead to a build-up of financial stability risks. Moreover, and this is more from a medium-term perspective, structural policies really need to lay the groundwork for strong, sustainable and inclusive growth over the medium term. How do we achieve that? First of all, further trade integration, including in services, along with product and labor market reforms, would not only help offset the demand shock from slower global trade, but also uh, facilitate the adjustment to realigning global supply chains. Revamping infrastructure, enhancing regulatory frameworks, and further opening the private uh, services sector to investment could also help raise potential growth. Finally, countries should focus on policies that incentivize lower greenhouse gas emissions, such as carbon taxes or emission trading systems, and on building fiscal buffers for meeting the growing financial needs to adapt to climate change and the increasing incidence of natural disasters. We know that there are several countries in the region that are particularly vulnerable to natural disasters, including Bangladesh, including Sri Lanka, including the Maldives, the Philippines, and these countries need to generate the financial resources to invest in adaptation strategies. So when we talk of equitable and sustainable growth, one of the main challenges for policymakers is to create an environment that's conducive to new and productive jobs for the labor force. And the challenges that we see for the Asia region are quite different according to which subset of countries you're looking at. In some of the, and, and you can see this in particular on, in the left-hand side uh, chart, uh, the countries on the left, including Thai, Thailand, China, Vietnam, and Malaysia, and Indonesia even, uh, in, in some of the, of the advanced economies and the well-established emerging markets of the region, the big challenge now is in fact population aging which as we know in Japan has already led to lower nominal GDP growth and high fiscal costs. The main challenge for countries with aging populations 
will be to stimulate labor supply by promoting the participation of women and the elderly in the, in the labor force, including, for instance, by expanding the provision of childcare facilities or uh, increasing the retirement age. If we look at other economies in the region, the countries with the green columns, um, especially those of South Asia, we have a very different situation because these are countries with young populations and a high potential demographic dividend. For Bangladesh, the working age population is expected to peak around 2035, for India and Nepal around 2040. For those countries, one key priority to harness the demographic dividend will be to create adequate job opportunities in the formal sector. How do you do that? Beyond investment in physical capital, the uh, governments need to focus on investing more in human capital, in particular education, upskilling, and me measures to broaden access to education over life, and vocational training in particular. Let me move now to the SDGs. So while there has been some considerable prog progress over these last years, notably with most ASEAN countries on track to er eradicate absolute poverty by 2030, the region still faces significant challenges to achieving the SDGs and improving economic welfare. Moreover, income inequality remains elevated in most countries and the shift towards manufacturing is having an impact on environmental sustainability. So regarding the likelihood of reaching the SDGs, one essential aspect is naturally that of financing, and this is where the IMF comes in in general. So the IMF recently estimated the cost of making significant progress towards the SDGs for education, health, roads, electricity, and water and sanitation in 49 low-income countries and 72 emerging market economies. Based on that study, and this is in line with what Dr. Paipoli showed previously, our estimate is that the additional annual spending required to make meaningful progress towards those SDGs is uh, for an amount of about $2.6 trillion per year. What does that mean? For emerging economies, this represents about four percentage points of their GDP in additional annual spending, while for low-income developing countries, the, av the average additional spending represents about 15 percentage points of GDP. So you see the magnitude of the challenge. This calls not, you know, first and foremost for the financial support of external partners from more advanced economies, especially for the low-income countries, but not to be forgotten, and perhaps most important of all from a national ownership and sustainability perspective is the mobilization of domestic revenue. I think Bangladesh is a case in point. While Bangladesh has, Im has achieved impressive economic growth and significantly reduced poverty, the low tax revenue GDP ratio does not allow for sufficient fiscal space to invest more in physical and human capital. Uh, so we believe that increasing the tax to GDP ratio by five percentage points of GDP in the next decade is an ambitious but reasonable target in many countries. Another challenge is addressing spending inefficiencies that's critical um, and uh, strengthening macroeconomic management, improving governance, strengthening transparency and accountability, and fostering a healthy business environments. Last point, um, I just want to is uh, address briefly the issue of climate change and shifting towards the use of renewable energies. As you know, the longer we wait before we address climate change, the greater the loss of life and the greater the damage to the economy. And the chart on the left illustrates the challenges of reconciling a fast growth trajectory, which calls for higher investment, and reconciling that with environmental sustainability. <coughs> and this calls for an innovative approach to promoting green technologies based on the polluter pays principle and the reshaping of tax systems and fiscal policies. In the IMF's view, in the coming years, governments will need to increase the price of carbon emissions to give people and firms the right incentives to reduce energy use and shift to clean energy sources. Um, 
carbon taxes are the most powerful and the efficient tools, but they need to be implemented in a fair and growth-friendly way. Uh, and also, carbon taxes need to be made politically feasible. So if governments raise additional revenue, they need to use that revenue wisely. Options include cutting other taxes, especially taxes that affect the business environment. And also, they need to support vulnerable households and communities. Um, let me just say that taxpayer money from carbon taxes would also help save more than 700,000 people a year in advanced and emerging economies who currently die from local air pollution. And the money that could be raised from carbon taxes would also help contain future global warming as agreed by the international community. Finally, governments need to adopt measures to support clean technology investments. They, these include power grid upgrades to accommodate renewable energy, research and development, and incentives to, uh, to overcome barriers to new technologies. So pardon me for exceeding my time, but thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Rother. Now going to the fourth uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Pedro Sultani, the Vice President of uh, CASI also. Uh, he has a very, very long, he, he happens to be a doctorate of, in medicine and uh, he's done an MBA and he speaks six languages. I, I just came to know. Huh? So let's hear from him now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know that all of you must be tired, so I try to be quick uh, in my presentation. I want to bring the discussion from the ground of uh, data and statistics uh, to uh, the ground of skills and the chambers. And as a person who has worked uh, with the chamber for so many years, uh, and many of you have done the same, we should identify the role of the chambers as well as the private sector in realizing uh, the sustainable development goals and sustainable growth. So I, I want to start, uh, 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 my uh, presentation consists of two parts. The first part is uh, a little bit about the function of the chambers, the history of the chambers, and the relation of the chambers with the community and the government. And the second part is a case study or a project which we have uh, experienced and which uh, we are doing in, in Iran. But before going to the presentation, I would like to say that uh, sustainable, in my opinion, means uh, a process which must be inclusive and participative. By these two words, I mean everybody, every part of, uh, of the society, I mean the three parts I'm going to that, should proactively identify and also uh, does his own or uh, her own uh, function in uh, the process of uh, sustainability. So the capacities of the chambers, as you all know, uh, uh, I can categorize them into just uh, uh, a few categories. Chambers are a pool of the SMEs, that means they have the network of the SMEs, they have access to small and medium-sized enterprises which don't have enough resources in order to participate and in order to uh, do their own task or role, if, uh, even if they understand that. Uh, in the process of sustainability and, sus and fulfilling sustainable development goals. They are a database of uh, goods and services. So once uh, uh, the chambers want to deploy some uh, goods and services to other projects, they, uh, uh, they can just easily understand how to do it. Uh, they are a source of, uh, uh, of entrepreneurs. And by saying entrepreneurs, I mean uh, a pool of initiatives, a pool of talent, and a pool of creativity, which uh, can come together and make doing projects on sustainability more creative. And we need actually creativity to be 
spiced up to the process of sustainability in order to bring it out of those bumps which are in front of the road. So they are uh, also a, a collection of expertise and they are also a network of the chambers all around the country and all around the world which can learn from each other or which can work together for bigger na subnational, national, or regional projects. Uh, I have prepared a, a video, uh, but I think the video must be played over there. It gives you uh, a very short information uh, about the history and the track record of the chambers throughout the four centuries that the chambers have evolved. Uh, please uh, watch the three minutes uh, motion graphic and then I'm going to continue. Uh, how can we play the motion graphic? Maybe from there. Because I don't have a play button. No. No, you should just play it. If you just... It doesn't have any... Uh, maybe it's here. No. I've, I've given it to you also another separate file, if you can just play it from there. I've given the motion graphic also separately. Uh, ah, but it has a voice, yeah? The voice is not there. Just push them up. Chambers have passed three generations so far since their inception. Chambers in their first generation were mainly focused on maintaining private sector's relations with the government in order to create a better business environment for their members. The first generation of chambers could be labeled, therefore, as government-oriented chambers. Some of the main areas of focus of the Chambers 1.0 were trade and tariffs, taxation, labor issues, investment climate, and deregulation. In other words, the first generation chambers' mission was to decrease business adversities for their members. The second generation of chambers could be called as member-oriented chambers. At the dawn of the 20th century, chambers realized that they could employ their abilities to provide more services to their members. They started issuing certificates of origin, authenticating commercial documents, dispatching trade missions, organizing business networking events, and giving training and education courses to their members. So the second generation chambers, Chambers 2.0, concentrated on building and increasing members' capacities. Since 1970s onwards, and following the development of corporate social responsibility concept, pioneering chambers started the evolution to the third generation chambers. As the representatives of the private sector, they deemed to be more responsible for the overall negative externalities of economic activities. So the third generation chambers became society oriented. On this path, society oriented chambers, Chambers 3.0, executed some initiatives. Some of them focused on CSR promotion, some partnered in environmental campaigns, others dealt into youth enabling or women empowerment projects, and many others appeared more frequently in charity activities. All right, so I think you have got a general idea about the, the evolvement of the chambers throughout these four centuries. So the modern chambers, or I would say the up-to-date chambers, now are community-oriented. That means they uh, not only render services to their members, but to the whole community. And I had put a question mark on what the next generation of chambers would be, and that is the globally-oriented chambers. 
we all know that the scale of the problems and the conflicts and the issues which we have, they have grown all over the, these years so that uh, uh, issues like sustainable development goals have been defined to tackle with those issues which are uh, actually threats for, for, for the whole world, for the one world we have, not only for a single city or a country. So that now we are, we are uh, just uh, confronting with uh, a bigger scale of uh, uh, the challenges, uh, but don't actually know how to cope with them and how to manage them. So the conventional uh, way of uh, the governance in each country is a form of uh, a hierarchy, uh, is a pyramid uh, on which uh, the government uh, stands on top and the so civil society and private sector are on the bottom. So commands used to come uh, top down and demands used to go bottom up. So this relationship has brought the current situation which we have. What we should do in order to realize and in order to fulfill our mission for the sustainable development goals is to try to reinvent the form of the governance in the countries. From uh, the hierarchical model of the governance, we should go to a kind of network governance where the, the government sits at the core of the network and the tasks and responsibilities will be distributed between the government, the civil society, and the private sector. And everybody feels or takes himself uh, responsible for the challenges of the society, of the country. So now, uh, as uh, Mr. Goodmanson uh, correctly mentioned, the one of the main challenges of uh, reaching to uh, the sustainable development goals is how to finance them. We are in a world that there is a, uh, uh, there is a conflict uh, between the government policies. From one side, they want to gather as much tax as possible. From the other side, they are competing with the other countries for, uh, better, for the betterment of the business environment and then they are giving some tax exemptions. So this, these two policies are conflicting. What to do for that is just to change the form of the governance so that the contribution from the community and from the society also will add up to the funds of the government so that they can uh, accelerate the pace of, uh, uh, of the sustainable development goals. So that means uh, in this form of the network governance, all three parts of uh, the society are the players of sustainability. And that is what has been put in the centerpiece of, uh, uh, of the 17 SDGs instructions by the UN. Uh, by this concept, I will go to the case study uh, and to what we have done in Iran. Was, and I'm short of time, sorry, but uh, uh, we thought that we should uh, learn from uh, things which uh, are the track record of the chambers as well as the, we should put into uh, the skills and, uh, and, and uh, the uh, uh, abilities of the private sector and the chambers in order to uh, define a project which is participative and inclusive. We defined the project by the name of my Iran campaign in order to build 100 schools in less developed areas and mostly remote areas of Iran. All of them pri primary schools because we learned from the World Bank that the effect of primary uh, education is more than double of the tertiary education in growth. So then we built, uh, we started to build 100 schools. By the time uh, we reached to, uh, we reached halfway we received some calls from the teachers or from the locals saying that they need some fixing in the uh, schools or there are some problems there. So we realized that still uh, a, a piece of the puzzle uh, is lacking. What was that? That was that they didn't have the sense of ownership on the schools that we used to build for them. So we just modified the model. We went to uh, a, a remote uh, uh, village we sat with the villagers over there. 
we listened to them, we learned about their pains and needs. First, we started to give them some facilitation in order to, uh, in order to remove some of those changes, some of those issues. And also, we selected a courageous architecture for building a school which could be also a, tu a tourist attraction for, this, for, for the village. By that time, we, are, we, we just got, uh, uh, we got to know about the skills and abilities of the village. So there was some kind of needlework, which, which was uh, previously done by women there, but they, they stopped doing that. So we gathered them all together. They started doing uh, the needlework again. Just uh, the colleagues, uh, they created a page on Instagram for them, and the page uh, has currently more than 40,000, 50,000 followers, and they are selling those needlework, and 100 women out of 250 women there are, are working in this startup. And that is a village startup. And more than 10 of youngsters, they are doing the marketing and the procurement. So through that, they, was, they, they were able to contribute uh, in building that school. 15% from the budget of the school came from those poor villagers. And also we got some share from the government and from the private sector. And we started just rectifying the problems they have in the sanitary system and uh, also uh, just giving, uh, learning them, uh, teaching them some skills and then building the school. Now the uh, village has been completely changed from a hopeless group of people without any skill, with bad situation of hygiene, and with miseducation and lack of a school, it has been an example in the country. Uh, I'm, uh, I've uh, run out of time, I'm so sorry for that, but I just wanted to say that we should identify the role of the chambers, the role of the private sector, we should sit with, with the civil society, we should sit with the government, we should try to reinvent the governance model of the country, Otherwise, we cannot fulfill the SDG goals or any other coming challenges in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have the uh, last speaker uh, from Bangladesh, uh, Mr. Asis Kupal. He is the managing director of uh, Mariko Bangladesh. Please go ahead, sir. Good evening and salam alaikum. Uh, for the last 10 minutes, I'll try and give a perspective from the corporate sector and my presentation I'll request you from, it's a thought starter uh, rather than a point of view. Uh, so to first thought starter is basically when you think from a private sector, we always think of a corporate social responsibility and the question uh, has come to, a, come to a status where in private sector now need to ask whether it is a responsibility or it's a necessity. If you uh, understand the history of mankind starting from a stone age, uh, to era of civilization without a leader, to a monarchy, to era of colonialism, uh, and, and a vibrant era of democracy. Uh, we are living in best of the time. If you see last 30, 40 years, uh, the time which we are living in is one of the best. Uh, life expectancy has increased, poverty has reduced, the gap between developed and developing nation has gone down. In fact, uh, Bangladesh is one shining example of such progress. Number of countries growing 5% uh, in last 30 years, vis-a-vis uh, -vis last 100 years, is much higher from a few to many. And uh, one, one or two particular things uh, which is constant, uh, which is driving this particular change, is one particular, which one is uh, more democratic, more democratization of information, more democratization of opinion, people having more right to express their opinion and freedom. And two is that countries are growing inclusively. The divide between societies is narrowing. Divide between countries is narrowing. And that is a prominent feature which is prompting us to say that we are living in a, one of the best time which probably humankind has experienced. In that context, what we need to ask ourselves is that if you want to give a better future to ourselves and our future generation, it is not a responsibility of growing inclusively. It is a necessity. And with that, as an organization which is operating into many countries, we believe that the business of business is more than business. Only profits cannot be the objective of, of firm. 
it has to be more inclusive growth and at marico we believe that it is the responsibility of corporate world to contribute towards a sustainable growth in country and in the areas which you operate in the second part in question which some of my colleagues uh, asked is it only responsibility of government to drive the change and the answer is no because when you say it has to be inclusive growth for a beneficiaries and from the angle of driving change it has to also be a growth which is fundamentally rooted in partnership and in that context corporate sector has to play more and more active role in terms of creation monitoring funding and driving the change in the society with the same philosophy as an organization we believe that a purpose which gives meaning to our existence as an organization is to make change in the lives of people we touch to transform surrounding in a most sustainable manner by nurturing and empowering them, the people we touch for maximizing their potential we believe that we are a consumer company we work with consumers we work at a ground roots in say bangladesh we go to around 1 million outlets we talk to people we meet consumers our understanding of consumer society and the changes which are seeping in at a ground level if incorporated in developing a model we can create a far far winning model globally as an organization we are aligned with education community sustenance healthcare and most importantly for any growing country fostering innovation because we believe the next level of growth for a developing countries will only come via innovation as a corporate which is more responsible and which wants to grow in a more sustainable manner we are aligned on this following areas which is responsible consumption of resources responsible contribution towards climate change and reducing the impact of negative climate activities sustainable supply chain production of which is responsibly and sustainably community development which is with our program of farmer outreach and most importantly driving diversity in your workforce in bangladesh we are living our purpose by making a difference in unlocking the human potential we believe that it is extremely important that we create infrastructure in the country which can take country towards a future generation and i really love some of the sentences which honorable advisor has spoken about in terms of education in terms of as basic as right to get books in terms of as basic as right to get electricity in terms of as basic as driving diversity and in many of those areas bangladesh is a shining example especially in the area of diversity if today rmg success is there it's primarily standing on the area of diversity because both men and women are contributing equally towards that sector and the growth of that sector in bangladesh uh, we are working with a flagship program of sopno it is in collaboration with undp and honorable government of bangladesh currently the impact we are already working uh, we are already uh, impacted around 9000 women in the areas of satkhira and kurigram we intend to touch the lives of 65000 ultra modern ultra poor women with a secondary beneficiary of 260000 surrounding families and a coverage of around 1000 unions around 22 districts in this endeavor we identify ultra poor women we equip her with a life training and assured uh, wages for certain amount of time from that wages she saves some money and create a rightful living wherein after the program ends she can create a future for herself in this endeavor it is not about giving charity it is about giving a respect and a respectful living to that woman where in society because of her poor status were denying her denying her that respect it is making her stand on her feet so that she cre can create a sustainable livelihood for her family second program which are working in bangladesh is a program of adambo here again with living with our principle 
of making a difference in the lives by unlocking potential. We are enabling a training to a differently enabled people by giving them a professional training so that they can seek employment with that training and again stand on their own feet. In this endeavor, we have also, also partners, partnered with a couple of private organizations like BRAC, Bikash, and I'm really thankful for these organizations coming in with us and partnering in our journey, wherein we can give that rightful and self-respected living to people who were neglected in society earlier. I already support it. So a couple of thought starters once again. How can a private sector contribute towards uh, SDG? As I said earlier, we can co-create, develop, design programs which can drive the changes, which can have an impact at a ground, ground level. Capital stewardship is, is, is expected from a corporate sector. Partnership beyond monetary contribution in terms of fulfillment by active participation of members. Just to give an example, in our Adamo program, we are encouraged our members to go and design programs such as merchandising, giving voice for a call center, helping them and training those people by going on ground. Now, at one level, we were empowering those people to get sustainable living. At other level, members of Marico were fulfilling the purpose of their existence by contributing towards society and still working in the job. Many of the organization doesn't give that, op that option, but this is a great example that how can you work and still contribute to a society and create a meaning for organization as well as your existence. We can help SDG and especially a social sector in terms of monitoring process, build an effective mechanism around it. There is also a point wherein how social change and where will funding come from. Taxes is one particular avenue, but we believe we also need to see from the competitive lens. While we can have the parallel mechanism wherein more and more corporate sector can be encouraged to contribute towards SDG goals, and there can be incentive towards corporate for contributing that. That is a more sound, sustainable mechanism so that you don't lose your competitive edge as a country. And most importantly, there has to be a heightened awareness with sessions like this. We already pledged 1% of our profits towards SDG goal in Bangladesh. And we, we are committed towards taking those profits from 1% to 2% in recent time and that's a committed for a country that's a that's a that's a commitment for unlocking the potential in a country which we are country we are operating in a small glimpse of a video which i want to share with you there's video out there at Marico, we believe that an organization must have a purpose which is much beyond profits. We strive to transform in a sustainable manner the lives of those we touch by nurturing and empowering them to maximize their true potential. Globally, the key initiatives aligned to our purpose are community sustenance, healthcare, education, fostering innovation. In Bangladesh, we are bringing alive our purpose of making a difference with Shopno by unlocking the potential of underprivileged women with livelihood skills and employability and Odomo by empowering differently abled youth with the right skills. My key for a circle of no for a call for Kaza. I said, Do you was red? I mean, we put a sweep for each other. Yes, look on a lot of hill, lot of it. I'm a number of no, Thank you.
स्वप्न प्रकल्प माध्यम थे जीवन बदलाई देखिए खूब सुखी खूब खुशी परिवार सुंदर भाव स्वप्न देखी With Odomo, we have made a beginning with specially abled youth getting jobs in private sector. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, with the paucity of time, I need to stop it. But that's all from my side, and thank you for being patient, listener. <clears throat> I think uh, the five uh, brilliant uh, speakers have covered uh, many points, uh, uh, which has uh, been uh, very illuminating and enlightening for all of us. Uh, they have covered from different different perspective, and uh, they from different countries, and they have given their uh, observation from their side, and also shared uh, their views. I think this is very very <coughs> uh, very important uh, subject that we are talking on. Just uh, if there is any question uh, you like to have uh, from the team here in front of me, uh, any any questions you like to raise? Uh, maybe one or two, maximum two questions. I'll take. Please identify yourself, please. Uh, is the mic there? Please, can you can you provide the mic? And please tell the question is directed to each speaker also, if you can. Uh, good evening, yeah, uh, just um, uh, madam. Just uh, well, I have yeah. already asked him to okay. uh, please. After Hello, this. Uh, Brian O'Gallagher, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Northern Territory, Australia. Um, it's more of to the whole panel. I believe what we have been talking about this afternoon is really important, but it's also about diversity and about how the chamber movement can move on. And I. I think there is a challenge because if you look across the room, most people across the room are my age or older. They're in suits, they're in ties. But the business community has moved on. So my challenge to the panel is, when we get to the 34th CACI conference and we have the same panel, is it possible or is it a vision? To have, we could have two youth entrepreneurs who are CEOs who are developing businesses in the digital age and so on, and very highly successful. Could we also have two female CEOs who are highly successful across the nation, uh, the world, as well as ourselves and distinguished guests like yourselves up there as well? Because I think we've, as a chamber movement. We've got to start representing the broader business private sector community, and we keep talking about it on slides, but we don't actually see it in the people represented. So there's a challenge for Kaki, and it's a positive suggestion because I think our youth and our uh, female business community are just as valid as everyone else, and they need to be represented on the stage like everyone else. Any comments? Thank you. Would anybody like to uh, take up the question? Yeah, I think, okay, ma madam. Yes, first we take the questions, then we'll answer together to save the time. Huh? Good evening. I am Dr. Fedosi Begum, a scientist and also entrepreneur. Um, I was held uh, in the meeting, so I am just uh, asking one thing that I am supporting the what he said that next. The 34th 
um, CSC meeting, we must invite young and successful entrepreneur should be. Uh, I am fully agree with him. And now my question is this, our uh, very respectable secretary and also coordinator of SDG, Dr. Abul Kalam Aza said that we are very successful in our country's SDG goal that the primary education of girls, health, and the um, other sides also. And Iran also uh, shows Sultan, Sultani so showed their girls' education. And I have seen some of the SDG program in Indonesians. So uh, in girls' education, uh, the dropping, you, you have experienced, I'm working in the villages uh, with the um, you know, farmers. So I have some experience that the, uh, the, they enter into, into the school, but in the, uh, after the primary school, the dropping you know, percentage is coming out that time. The, our, our government is very much uh, you know, concerned about it, the, about the uh, dropping out. But I want to know that the other countries that they have any study or any data of dropping, dropping out the after primary education of girls' educations. And next, I have one question to IMF. That Can you make the question very short, please? So yeah, and the last one. That IMF showed the, all the countries, you know, data, but I don't find the Bangladesh is one. Uh, he's shown the Asians, different, different countries, even in India, but I have no uh, any data from Bangladesh. So can you explain that? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just taking two questions. Huh? Uh, so anybody from the panelists would like to uh, take up this uh, question? Uh, by the way, just to tell you that uh, we have a differentiation for the youth also. They have a very tomorrow, I think, the, for the young entrepreneurs, uh, the session is there anyway. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you'd like to say something, sir? Uh, we have several sessions tomorrow with uh, female entrepreneurs, uh, just to let our friends from Australia know. And also, uh, the earlier session that you had, we had a young entrepreneur from uh, Hungry Naki, which is a, a web-based food delivery system. And uh, the, the whole team there is uh, yeah, relatively younger. Uh, younger is probably not the right word. Relatively younger uh, CEO. And also tomorrow we have one of the a version of Uber CEO here who would be speaking as well. So Tomorrow, we have a yeah. very mix of experience, uh, seasoned uh, leadership in ex government executives, corporate executives, and chamber leadership, as well as uh, up and coming ones, including females, who represents about 50% of Bangladesh's population. So just for your information, our friends from Australia. And uh, next time, we'd like to see more participation from our Australian delegates with uh, women um, delegates member when you come next time around as well, as well as the young ones. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, any of the panelists would like to take the questions that uh, just a very short one, sir. Um, just to responding his question uh, and suggestion. Uh, a few months back, once I was requested to participate in a panel discussion like this, I could have the opportunity to, lo to look into the name of the panelist. I find no women is there. So I told, if I participate this uh, panel, uh, that is not fair because my boss, Prime Minister, always encourages the women to be there. So I declined to be there. Then they, uh, they discussed with so many women and finally they got uh, one lady so that she could participate. This is very much always we need to look into uh, the participation of women so that uh, uh, they get encouragement and always we if we share with women, we get better ideas. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pedram, please. Uh, I'd like to uh, see the issue you raised uh, from another perspective. Uh, we, we all know that each business and industry uh, has a life cycle. Chamber is also a business. Chambers also have a life cycle. I showed the involvement of the chambers over time. 
uh, now chambers are perceived by the youth as uh, a, a traditional or old-fashioned kind of uh, business organization. We also should reinvent the business model of the chambers so that we can make them more inclusive, so that the, the youngsters uh, will become more willing to become our members. They, now, you know that we have junior chambers of commerce all around the, the world. So they have created their own organizations by the name of the chamber because they, didn't, uh, they, they were not allowed to enter into some of the chambers. I have the, an experience uh, in my, uh, my own country. And then uh, they separated themselves. So we, we should reshuffle uh, the, the model we are gathering uh, and we are, we are just uh, sitting with each other in the chambers. We should make them more inclusive. Sustainability is not only about those goals, it's about also our for, uh, form of the organizations like the chambers. So we should make also the chamber model also more sustainable. Oh, yes. Yes. First of all, to wholeheartedly agree with the suggestion to have more diversity on panels, but also more, more diversity and participation in economic life, I think. And in, from that sense, and coming back to the question on Bangladesh, I didn't refer to Band Bangladesh specifically because I, I was asked to cover all countries in the region. But I think, you know, th there is a key issue of participation of women in the labor force in Bangladesh, which is considerably lower than for males. And I think there are maybe two important priorities in that regard. That's access to education, but not only primary education, mostly secondary and vocational education, and the acquisition of skills that are important for integration into uh, the formal uh, labor market. And then another very important issue is access to finance. And access to finance is not only about microcredit, it's access to formal credit in, through the banking system, where you can have more capital, more expertise, more support from uh, corporate advisory teams. That type of uh, access to formal financing mechanisms is, I think, a uh, major challenge still for, for, for women. Uh, and I think, you know, what's interesting to note in the case of Bangladesh, Bangladesh achieved major successes uh, in integrating women in the labor force, especially in the RMG sector. You know, the, the development and the growth of the RMG sector in Bangladesh owes to the participation of women in this sector. I think a worrying trend is that as we see more automation in the sector, we see that the participation of women in the RMG sector in Bangladesh has been declining. And that's an indication, maybe, that these women either do not have access to the supervisory jobs or to the acquisition of some of those skills that are relevant in a world where automation will become increasingly important. I think this highlights some of the challenges that we face moving forward. I give the, uh, some supplement from Australia. You know, that's the, uh, my presentation that mentioned us. You know, the uh, SDG implementation is the have uh, spent 3.3 .3 up to 4.5 trillions. Uh, you know, the, the ODA money does come from the, uh, you know, the OECD, uh, DAC, including the emerging dust. So the 180 uh, billions is still a uh, big gap. And I mentioned that the 3.6% uh, for the, uh, you know, for private sector involvement, it could be the uh, hope uh, for the SDG uh, implementation. So just you mentioned the uh, entrepreneurs, it could be the good opportunity part. But, you know, when we take into account all of that, the mentioned that eventually uh, still the uh, capacity building, you know, for developing world and the developed, uh, developers could be, uh, have a no uh, difficult task. But in developing world, uh, for instance, the financial part, 
Also, the data collection and the data analysis could be, you know, have a big uh, pro, uh, problem does. Uh, so that the capacity building, you know, for the young uh, generation through the education, also the, uh, that creates uh, many opportunities uh, for the uh, young people, even the women, uh, including us. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, I'll uh, answer the last question. And uh, as I promised that, I will bring in a different perspective on the thing of uh, uh, girls getting dropped out from the school. See, any uh, any outcome is, is fundamentally driven by the belief. And we believe because we work with the consumer, uh, consumer. And, and there is statistical data which proves that the education of a mother is linked to the progress and the prosperity of family. More progressive, more educated is a woman the progressive and a prosper is a family because then your kids study well. There's a better financial management. There's a workload sharing from husband. So if that particular aspect needs to be changed, the belief surrounding that needs to be changed. There has to be a propagation of a belief that if a girl studies, she brings in the progress and the prosperity of family and slowly, slowly things will start changing. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the panelists uh, covered uh, most of the points and the response, the answers has been also well uh, given. Uh, my observation actually, I, I, we are born, you know, in this planet to live, not only to exist. And the gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening. And such forum uh, like Cassie, uh, could be a platform to, you know, harness the opportunities that we have with each country, each nation, or in, in, individual, so that we network and not not work, you know. So you have to be networking in this platform to, you know, share your ideas, views, opportunities. And uh, there is a saying that one flower doesn't make a garden. So we have many flowers, you know. So a one prosperous nation in a region is not going to make a difference, you know. So we have to see the growth, the balance growth is equally needed. So in order to make this world very happy, prosperous, sustainable, I think we have to work and believe on you. So there are challenges, there are opportunities. We live in a society where a lot of challenges are there with us, but it's up to us to tap the opportunities and fight the challenge. Nobody is born with everything. If you are born poor, that's your problem. But if you die poor, if you are born poor, this is not, not your problem. But if you die poor, then that's your problem. You know? So the, the problem, I think, what I'm trying to share with you is everybody has the opportunities. But how do you tap that opportunities and harness for a betterment? When uh, Mr. Ab Mr. Abul Khan Azad shared his views uh, and how this Bangladesh is, you know, trying to graduate uh, to a middle income group in the next, you know, couple of uh, years. The process, the progress is, is something very exemplary. You know, I think we have to learn also and also share our, uh, this type of uh, feelings in the, uh, in, in, our, in our society. The thing that I could observe is uh, we, this whole uh, continent, this sub, uh, Asia Pacific uh, is a habitant of more than half of the world population. And uh, there are challenges, uh, no doubt, but the opportunities are also equally there. So the 17 SDG of 169 uh, targets, which was announced by the UN in 2015, despite of the progress that we have made in the last couple of years, uh, I still feel that the, within the region, uh, it's not really possible to achieve by 2030 unless uh, you know, we, we have to change the mode and the speed of our, uh, I mean, the, uh, the development. This country, in the process of globalization, you know, the, the speed of uh, modernization is so fast, unless you cope up with this world, you will be left behind. It's an information highway. And one need to know, 
at what speed you have to drive. And it's a single, uh, it's a one-way highway, you know. It's not that people can return back from the same route. So there's a different highway for different routes, you know, and the speed that is up to you to take it up. So we are in a period of a tremendous, uh, you know, change and challenges and opportunities too. And there is a significant shift from the, uh, for in poverty and inequality, climate and economic growth. Shifts are a separate phenomena, inequality and injustice, so as poverty. Inequality is a close obstacle in achievement of the SDG. So my, t my point is here that the SDG to achieve that, it's all of us to have to put up your sleeves and work hard to achieve the target that we intend to meet. So without taking much time, I think we have already crossed the time. And I once again like to, I think let's give a big hand of, uh, round, round of applause to the, uh, the speakers here. I think the, this session has been quite interesting and uh, I'm sure you have been enlightened with the deliberation that they have made. And I'd like to thank uh, the ABCCI for a wonderful uh, session. Though it's, it was the last session to keep you awake and to continue with this was a challenging task. And uh, on behalf of the chairman uh, and me as uh, Pradeep Shrestha, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to close this session. Thank you, moderator and the speaker of the session. Now, to show our appreciation, may we request the session chairman, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Shrestha, to come forward and to do the honor of presenting tokens of appreciation to the speaker of this session. Mr. Shrestha, please. First of all, we may request. First of all, we may request our moderator to kindly present the token of appreciation to Mr. Abul Kalam Ajad. Now we may have our next speaker, Dr. Pai Poli, please. Now our next speaker, Mr. Ragnar Gudmansen, please. Now Dr. Pedram Sultani, please. May we have our next speaker, Mr. Ashish Gopal, please. Now, we'd like to call Mr. Rajul Karim Riznu, Vice President of FBCCI, and Mr. Shujib Ranjun Dash, Event Coordinator and Director of FBCCI, to present a token of appreciation to the session chairman. Thank you, everyone. That ends our third plenary session. We would like to invite all our registered delegates at the dinner at 7.30 p.m. at poolside. Thank you.
To all our participants, thank you very much for joining with us today. Have a pleasant day now.